I trust your minds are suitably blown. Um, so for our final panel discussion, we're going to bring it back to a question that's a, perhaps a bit more tangible, um, and that is there um, life elsewhere in the universe? And joining me on stage tonight is a very British lineup. Uh, you'll get to experience the full range of British accents, but I'm delighted that uh, the panelists joining me on stage are Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who is an astrophysicist and chancellor of the University of Dundee and a visiting professor at the University of Oxford. She's led numerous organizations, including the Institute of Physics and the Royal Astronomical Society. And among her many, many achievements, she discovered pulsars opening up a new branch of astrophysics. And we honored Jocelyn's achievements last night at the Breakthrough Awards, where she received a, a huge standing ovation. Uh, John Hardy is a geneticist and professor of neuroscience at University College London. He discovered mutations in the gene that causes early onset Alzheimer's disease and formulated the most successful model of the disease so far developed and won the Breakthrough Prize in 2017. And finally, Kim Naismith holds the Whiteley Chair at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Oxford, where he's done seminal work on cell division and the molecular structure of DNA, including the loop extrusion hypothesis for how DNA is folded up into chromosomes. And he won the Breakthrough Prize in 2018. So like the previous panels, uh, I'm going to start off with a quote from Stephen Hawking's book um, about the question of, is there life in the universe? And the quote is, there's fossil evidence that there was some form of life on Earth about three and a half billion years ago. This may have been only 500 million years after the Earth became stable and cool enough for life to develop in the universe and still have time left to, do, to evolve into beings like us who could go on and ask about the origin of life. If the probability of life developing on a given planet is very small, why did it happen on Earth in about 1 14th of the time available? Kim, when we think about the phenomenon of life, um, we've only got one example to um, work with. Um, how much do we know about when and how life got started here on Earth? Well, there's a very simple answer to that. We have absolutely no idea. Um, <laughs> I, I, we've, uh, up until now, we've really been listening to sort of people who are theoreticians. And I think what we've got here are very different kind of scientists. And, and really, we're, we're empirical, empirical scientists. And you, like Jocelyn, she, nobody was looking for pulsars, but it, it, you weren't... It was always all the great discoveries in science and the driving force of science is, 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 is finding things that your existing knowledge can't explain. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, ultimately the, your, the answer to your question will not come, in my view, um, and most of the answers, most of the driving force of all science hasn't come from people thinking about things. It's, it's about people observing things that couldn't be explained by what we already know and, and then having to come up with new ideas that are stimulated by those observations. And the real problem with the, the origins of life is, is we can't make those, the sorts of observations that will stimulate the scientific process. That's the fundamental problem. And we can you know, cook things up in the, t in, in, in the laboratory and say, well, we can simulate what we think might be going on, but you will never know because in the process of doing that, you're doing something that will always be making you happy. You say, oh, look, I've simulated something that could have led to the origins of life. But it's almost impossible to do those sort of experiments and, 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 and get a very surprising and unexpected result. But it's those that are the things that, that drive our, our knowledge and, um, and that drive the scientific process. And you, by definition, you, you can't do that unless you can actually observe it. That's a, that may be a very, you know, I'm make, making a very sort of extreme point of view, but we, we have to be able to observe these things. And that basically means we've got to find it somewhere else, I think, before we can start mm -hmm. to think clearly about it. Mm -hmm. um, so so on, on that point, I mean, Jocelyn, we, we've just got one example, um, but based on our one example, we know that planets are good homes for life. Um, how hospitable is the rest of the solar system? 
Actually, our understanding of what hospitable might be is changing. Uh, it used to be felt, well, the planet's either side of us, that they're really a bit dodgy for life for various reasons, and stuff beyond that, well, forget it. But now they're beginning to wonder about some of the moons of the major planets, uh, which are icy, but underneath the ice, could there be, might there be? So we're in quite a state of flux, I think, in, term, in terms of the solar system. Um, but actually, I think we also need to look wider because we're now finding lots and lots of planets around lots of other stars. Um, so this is something that's happened very much in, in our lifetimes. Absolutely. Um, and uh, so, you know, how many how many planets do we know about, and, and, and what's our sort of state of uh, state of our knowledge of, of those planets? Well, the number's going up very fast because there are missions like the Kepler mission that are, are finding a lot of planets. But as of the 1st of October, it'll be bigger now, but as of the 1st of October, 3,851 confirmed planets, um, and a number of them are in multi-planet systems. So there's 2,871 systems. So quite a few have multiple planets. And, and that's just from the small patch that Kepler's, largely from the small patch that Kepler's been observing. So you can safely say, um, typical observation of the night sky outside the city, you see about 6,000 stars. You now say to yourself, I can say 6,000 stars, but there's more than 6,000 planets out there. So, so Kim, if we found uh, life elsewhere, would it be based on carbon? Does it have to be carbon-based life? Um, I'm, um, I, I'm not a good enough chemist to, 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 uh, to, you know, to give you a sensible answer on that. Um, I think that um, I think most people think yes, it would need, you yeah. know, you need compounds like carbon, and, there, and there's only so many elements out there, and. Um, I think the real question is, is um, would it, even if the chemistry is going to be different, will the principles be the same? That is, will it have to be, I mean, all life on this planet is cellular. We do know that you can have compartments inside cells that can maintain a certain identity which don't have membranes around them. But I think most biologists would probably say that, you know, that, that probably the evolution of the cell is fundamental and that we're, if we find life elsewhere, it will also be cellular. And if you accept that it's gonna be cellular and you accept that you've got to have, in order for life to have evolved, you have to have an evolutionary system and therefore you have to have a system of reproduction so the Darwinian process can work. So then you've got these, the enzymes, and this is the wonderful thing about the RNA world is that they were capable of, of, of reproducing and doing enzymology, and that solved the, the problem that, the, that one had of how it all got started. But you've, you've got a, still a fundamental problem, which is that you've got all these enzymes there that are self-reproducing, you've got the cells divide, but you've got this small number problem, and every now and then you lose one, and once you've lost it, a bit like um, you know, Jared Diamond's ex uh, book about you know, what happens to cultures when they get too small. Once you lose information, you can't get it back again. And so you have this fundamental problem, which I think is going to be a universal aspect of life, is A, you've got to reproduce, you've got to be able to evolve, but you've also got to segregate such that you always maintain the information. And therefore, then you start beginning to ask, well, how do you solve the segregation problem and that's probably where DNA came in, because it said, okay, we can't solve it by just having, you know, you can either solve it by having very large cells, but that puts a, a number on the numbers. But as soon as you go down to a level where you could lose something, the solution is to have something that you, you, you have a repository of that information, which you then take enormous care to segregate, to ensure that, that and it contains all the information to make all of that stuff. And so my gut feeling, I'm a sort of optimist, is that if we find life elsewhere, and we, we will eventually, uh, and we can actually study it, which is the, the big problem, I think, um, that, that we'll find that the same principles will apply. There will, be univer there will be universal laws of biology, just as we have universal laws in, in physics. I think it'd be very disappointing if they, they didn't emerge, and I suspect that 
even if there are alternative chemistries for making a, a substance like DNA, that, that you have to bear in mind, even if there are different chemistries, there will have been competition between them, and it could be that DNA is a winner, or RNA was a winner. Um, and so even, it, it could well be that, you know, there is only one solution, because there's only one winner in this game. And, uh, it, you know, I can only think one of the good reasons for, only good reason for wanting to live much longer than we normally allowed to live on this planet is one could live long enough to find out. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of the, none of us will, but it's, it's going to be one of the great, great questions in science. So, so Jocelyn, we can't do DNA sequencing on Alpha Centauri, Centauri, but how would we go about looking for primitive life um, on a planet beyond the solar system? I'll answer that in a moment, but I'd just like to follow up something that Kim alluded to. Uh, astrophysicists can study a number of molecules in space. Uh, the easiest ones to study are the smallest because they have fewer transitions. Uh, and one of the molecules we study a lot is carbon monoxide. They have detected carbon monoxide in some of the most distant objects we can view. And it behaves exactly the same as carbon monoxide here. So chemistry has been chemistry throughout the life of the universe. That seems a reasonably plausible extension of saying the carbon monoxide transitions have been the same billions of years ago as they are now. And that's at least one useful uncertainty pinned down. So how, how you might detect habitable? Um, probably actually by doing spectroscopy. Um, I think you might pick up signals from intelligent life, radio signals. Oh, we'll come to that, like that in a second, yeah. Yeah, but certainly you could look for... Um, for example, you could look for the atmosphere of a planet, look at the chemical balance or out of balance-ness of the atmosphere. And if you find an atmosphere that's out of balance, that strongly suggests there's some biological activity going on, driving the atmosphere out of chemical equilibrium. Okay, so in the same way we heard earlier on about how photosynthesis has changed our atmosphere or how we, yep. we might see, um, we, we've seen on, on Mars sort of interesting signs of methane, haven't we, that might be um, attributed to biological origins. I know maybe, that's really kind of maybe. out there. That's yeah. out there, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I mean, primitive life. Um, John, it's, it's a big step from primitive life to intelligent life, isn't it? Um, so what are the major steps involved in going from primitive life to creatures that can do more intelligent things, like um, plan ahead or come to an event like this? or um, well, multicellularity is obviously a key change, and that happened pretty early. Um, I think that, um, you know, intelligent life has, uh, has evolved a couple of times here in, on, on Earth, and I don't mean, um, what I mean by that is, uh, you know, octopuses and squid and so on, are, are, it's all, that's, that's, a ver that's a very separate tree of life to, to, to dolphins and humans, which might be one mm -hmm. side of the tree of life. So I think that, um, you know, once life evolves, the intelli intelligent life, I think, is likely to follow because, you know, life needs to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, observe light, what life needs to have an input from its environment, and all of those things are things which concentrate sensory organs together and bring, I think, nervous systems together. And then there's a kind of a competition again to the, for, the, for the organisms, a Darwinian competition for those who do it most effectively. And I think that once, uh, that actually intelligent life is not as big a step, well, I don't think intelligent life, if, in fact, you know, of course, what we're worried about is, is, uh, is whether we have intelligent life on Earth at the moment, <laughs> frankly. But, uh, yeah. but, you know, once intelligent life, once life starts, I think in intelligent life is a very likely outcome. It, it's mm -hmm. evolved separately several times on Earth. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
Um, but is all that intelligence, you know, human intelligence, dogs, octopuses, crows, etc. I mean, are, are they all running on the same sort of neural software? Sure. They, well, I mean, octopuses are quite a bit different. They, yeah. they, uh, they, uh, they don't use alternate splicing. They use RNA editing. Uh, their eyes, for example, are a separate, uh, are evolved entirely separately. It's a parallel. It's a convergent evolution. So. So, no, I think that, uh, you know, I think they're quite, they're, they're, they're separately evolved. Of course, they're built, up, as we have discussed, on DNA, RNA, protein. So they're not in, entirely independent events to, to, hum, to human evolution, but they are very separate. So that brings me to the next question, that how alien could aliens actually be? You know, do you think that, um, uh, any intelligence found elsewhere in the universe? Will, it, will we inevitably have things in common? You know, will we have eyes, for example, and oh yeah, I think we'll have arms uh, or trunks or you yeah, know, for sure. No, I think I mean for sure. I mean, I, look at octopuses. I think that you know you're looking when you look at an octopus, you're looking at something that is really quite different, but you know, recognisable in its intelligence. So I think that. Uh, that one might expect things to, to be quite different, but have recognizable characteristics. Yeah, can I just qualify that slightly? I mean, I'm not disagreeing with you, but an awful lot of what the life will look like will depend on the spectrum of their star and what their atmosphere lets through. It's absolutely no coincidence that our eyes are geared to work where the sun's peak output is or at least yeah. the sun's peak output as modified by the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, for instance, if, if it all were different and radio waves were the important wavelength, our eyes would be radar dishes, you know, this far apart, and clearly our heads would be different sizes, and we might not be so viable. Yeah. So it does, it does depend on the, the parent star as well. Do you want to come in near, uh, Kim? No, it takes two to tango. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jocelyn, you, you, you mentioned, um, uh, you talked about radio signals, and mm -hmm. uh, you're receiving the Breakthrough Prize um, this year for your discovery of pulsars. When you discovered uh, your first pulsar source, you called it L LGM-1, which stood for Little Green Men 1. No, um, we didn't. You, oh. don't, you don't name the first one 1. It's only when you've got more than one that you label it one. <laughs> Apologies. Apologies. <laughs> well, how, but how seriously did you, did, did you, um, you know, I've heard that this story, and it's, it's a sort of wonderful story, but, but at the time, um, you know, how seriously did you take that possibility that you had discovered alien life? We had to take it at least half seriously, uh, amongst another, a number of other possible things that it could be, to try and get a feel for what it was. Uh, but actually, a civilization that signals at a frequency of 81.5 megahertz, using what was apparently amplitude modulation, because the pulse period was constant, so it wasn't frequency modulated, they aren't intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> it's daft. Any <laughs> telecommunications engineer would tell you that's not, that's not intelligent life. <laughs> um, if you are going to signal to life elsewhere, you'd use the hydrogen line because hydrogen is the most common element and is universal as far as we can tell. And it has a very special transition at a, a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So you'd use that. And you wouldn't use amplitude modulation of the signal because there's far too much gubbins in, international, in interstellar space that could modulate the signal by accident. You have to use an FM signal. So that's how you do it. Um, and nobody's seen it yet. Yeah, so why haven't we seen intelligent life yet? Maybe it's not there. Maybe it doesn't want to be known. It doesn't care about us, you know. It's intelligent enough not to want to advertise its existence. Well, I mean, we think about our, um, you know, our broadcasts uh -huh. out to um, how far have, you know, I mean, how long has it been since we've been broadcasting out there, and how far will have our broadcasts reached? 
So we started radio broadcasts in, what, the 1930s? And this is 70 years on, 80 years on, so it's got 80 light years out into space. All those wonderful programs that we broadcast. <laughs> So 80 light years. So and uh, so and, and so where are the, the nearest um, the nearest planets beyond the solar system? Not sure we not sure I know the answer to that one. But you know it, it is an issue. Um, admittedly, as the signals get further out into space, they get weaker and weaker. But we have made we have been advertising our presence inadvertently mm -hmm. through our broadcasts, TV and radio. I mean, do, do you get a sense that, you know, when you look up in the night sky that, um, that there just must be something looking back at us? You know, space is so vast. There are so many planets out there. Um, you know, what, what, do you, what do you just feel about, about that? Do you feel there has to be life, life out there? I don't know, to be honest. Um, it's, it's not something that engages me in the abstract. But if you start picking up signals where you start looking for signals, then you have to start asking some hard questions. Um, Kim, is that something that, um, that, that, that you sort of, you know, how do you feel about that? that uh, I agree, rather agree with Jocelyn. I mean, you've got to observe it before you can to get traction on this problem. Um, it can't be, you know, yeah. yeah. I mean, the first thing we tell our students uh, in the, certainly in the biological sciences is N of one is not enough <laughs> to, uh, to, to make a theory. You need to go back and repeat the experiment. And of course, what we're doing now is we have an N of one. But I mean, if I was to say my belief and that, because I think I tell my students if they've only done something once, it only, ma only amounts to a belief. But my belief is I think there will be things out there. I think they will be carbon-based for the reasons that Kim said, I think that the replication is going to be based upon hydrogen bonds because those are the only bonds which are both weak enough and strong enough, so to speak, to allow, allow replication. So I would say there is going to be a, there are going to be carbon-based life forms whose replication method depends upon hydrogen bonds. There are going to be those out there. Why we haven't seen them, uh, the distances are huge. Yeah. And why should they want to, to see us, particularly at the moment? Or, or could it be that, you know, it's, it's the lack of alien signals telling us that, you know, primitive life is, is hard to get started? Or is it that even when life exists, brains only evolve very rarely? No, it's telling us the universe is very big and spaced out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what do the biologists think of that? The, again, do you, do you agree with Jocelyn that just space is so big that that? Yes. I mean, I defer to the experts. Here. <laughs> um, but so space is big. There's no doubt. There's no, <laughs> big question. no doubt. Right. And, and that life is very difficult to study as well. I mean, it doesn't, you know, unless you get round to, to, to broadcasting reality TV, you are not you know, octopuses have not yet uh, broadcast their existence to the rest <laughs> no, of the universe. No, exactly, yeah. Um, and if it hadn't been for the meteorite, nor would we be. So, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, it, it, though there is a sort of inevitability of intelligent life, but producing a life that, you know, octopuses are it, creating radio signals underwater, it may have been technically rather difficult, mm -hmm. you know, all that salt would yeah. have made it <laughs> very <laughs> difficult. And so um, it wasn't, it's not inevitable that you ended up building um, radio telescopes and, mm. and transmitting radio waves. So, so just a final question for all of you. Um, you know, what would it mean to you personally if we discovered primitive or intelligent life um, beyond Earth? If it's primitive life, I see it as a milestone. If it's intelligent life, it's then raising interesting sociological questions about do we make contact? Should we make contact? Do we assume they're friendly? How do we, the Earth, get our act together to act as one body? I think the United Nations is meant to be in control of that, so. <laughs> <laughs> so do we have an official response? Um, if we detect signals that look like intelligent life, the, 
the people we go to are the United Nations. Yeah. Good. Good mm. luck with that. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so, and, and John and Kim, so what, what would it mean to you if we found, uh, if, if we found life on, um, um, well, on I say, think, Mars or Enceladus think, or the clouds of Venus? Yeah, I, I think if the chemistry is similar, then the first thing you've got to worry about is that we're either going to eat them or they're going to eat us. Mm. Um, and so I, I'd be very worried that we're going to just, you know, we you know, we in fact, you know, just we know this has happened because you know through exploration we brought in diseases that yeah. killed off civil, you know, cultures and civilization. So I think the worry is we destroy it or they destroy us. So that would be my major anxiety. I'm but sorry. from what Jocelyn said, we could still know about it, but you know, it could still be far enough away that. Um... Ah, well, that yes, that would be. The best of all possible worlds. <laughs> 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 but will we be able to know enough about it if, if it's far enough away that we wouldn't destroy, you know, that's... Um. Uh, and John, what are, what are your thoughts? Uh, uh, well, I mean, I think that dis dis discovering things similar to, mi micro uh, to bacteria and so on, which is possible on Mars and possible on some of the Jupiter moons, I think that would be... A revelation because it, we would have got to an N of two and I think it would mm -hmm. change our philosophy mm -hmm. about these things enormously. Intelligent life, I th just don't think we're going to, you know, I don't think it's a question that, we, that this generation is going to, to have to d deal with. But we, we, we are going to, it is possible that we will find primitive life even in our own solar system. That, that's for sure possible. And that will, ha that will mean that we won't have these discussions because I think we'll <laughs> then accept that there is life elsewhere. And that's going to be a big philosophical change, I think. Mm -hmm. There's one thing about these moons. They're, they're, they're very exciting and, and, and they're going to have thermal vents and that's maybe where we think life started. But my understanding, these moons, the moons that are most likely to have life on them are actually very, very young. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's the... Yes. I think that's the real yeah. worry, is actually they're really... T I, I haven't realised this until, you know, a few months ago. That no, they're it's really very billion. young indeed. Yeah, you have to have stability for... It um, sounds like a billion so years of it, stability. Yeah, and they're, they're only a few million years old or something yeah. ridiculously young. So I, that's the worrying thing. We might have to go further afield. So I'd just like to turn to the, the audience now. So having, you know, you've, you've heard from our panellists here. So if we could just have a, just a show of hands, I'm going to ask you a really simple question. Who thinks there is life out there in the universe? Yeah. <laughs> I'd say that was uh, pretty, um, I'm going to say that was about even. So, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I think um, lots of optimists out there. Um, well, I think we, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, um, please, I think, I, I would like to thank our panellists, Jocelyn Bell-Burnell, John Hardy and Kim Naismith. Thank you so much for your views yeah. and your contributions there. I think we've had, we've had an, an incredibly stimulating, mind-blowing evening. So I think if you could please put your hands together and thank all of our panellists that you've heard this evening. And finally, and finally, um, you've been such an enthusiastic um, audience. You've laughed at um, all Lee's jokes earlier on uh, and, uh, and Derek's jokes. You've been so enthusiastic. Thank you so much for coming. And you deserve a round of applause as well. Thank you very much.